welcome everyone on this platform. It is really my absolute pleasure to um, be with you all for another week. And um, of course, as you would have seen from the notification, we have with us Professor Carlos Sumariot, who is at Roger Williams University. She has a great, um, she's, she's been to a couple other institutions prior to this. And as was mentioned, she is a, one of our own. She's a graduate from the Department of Chemistry. She gained her PhD um, from working in our lab downstairs. So we were lab mates at some point in time. She's a couple years younger than me though. Um, and she has a whole myriad of honors and awards associated with her name in foreign. She, she, had, um, she went ahead and she did a postdoc overseas. And from then, I haven't seen her since. <laughs> um, she has been, been overseas doing a lot of excellent work. And one of the things that I saw from her CV is that she was involved in 2016 with a 3D virtual reality crime scene facility for undergrad students. And I trust that she will show us a little bit about that as well as some other things that she is doing. She is an absolute trailblazer, ladies and gentlemen. She's won many awards and honors. And I didn't even know that she was, a, she was working in forensic sciences before she entered the, um, she did her PhD. That is, that is new information for me. And so um, we really are very, very pleased to have her with us this morning. And so without any further ado, I am going to hand over to Professor Carlos Marriott. And I do notice in the audience that Professor Henry is here and welcome um, to you, Professor Holder, as well as other persons who are with us this morning. So. Go right ahead, Professor Mario. Blessings. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Winklet. And a good thing you used my um, uh, nickname before most of the um, individuals signed on here. Um, <laughs> so uh, it is really, truly um, an honor to uh, be here and present to everyone uh, this afternoon, uh, this morning, sorry. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, um, I spent the last 15 years before coming here to Rhode Island at Roger Williams in Savannah, Georgia. So I'm just getting my foot down and settled here. Um, and I'm happy to join you uh, this morning. So my talk really is not really a chemistry chemistry talk, but it's really about my journey um, and my career in science and all the little things that I've done along the way. Um, I cannot see the chat. So if anybody uh, has a question in the chat, um, we can uh, address it later, but feel free to jump in and ask any questions during my presentation. Um, it can be like a discussion. Um, so, my title is An Adaptable Career in Science. So really when you start out having completed a PhD in chemistry, you're kind of focused and thinking that you should do chemistry and chemistry research and all things related to chemistry um, within your specific discipline. And yes, so I started out kind of like that. And here's a throwback picture. Um, and that's us in that lab that Winklet was talking about um, with uh, some of my lab mates. And some of you might recall Greg and Andrea Golson and Townsend. Um, and that's me in the middle looking quite geeky. I think I actually set them up for that picture. So, <laughs> and of course my wonderful um, research advisor, uh, Dr. Yvette Jackson, the great Yvette Jackson. Um, so I had a wonderful experience at the University of the West Indies and I'm so happy to be here. It wasn't so long ago. Uh, then I moved on from uh, UE and went to Clemson. I actually met um, uh, Professor Huffman at uh, the Natural Products Symposium, right? And uh, that's where, you know, we kind of uh, um, established a relationship. So that was a nice little networking experience. 
And uh, um, so I applied to do postdoc with him, which was also a great experience. I couldn't have asked for something better. Um, and he has a very distinguished background. Um, I mean, he worked with the late professor um, Robert Woodward, um, Nobel Laureate in chemistry. And of course, uh, he's like the godfather of organic synthetic chemistry. Um, so I spent uh, like three and a half years um, in Clemson working on cannabinoids, which is relevant to the field of forensic science, which I branched off into when I accepted a position as an assistant professor at Savannah State University in Georgia. So um, time rolls on quickly. And so basically, you know, starting out with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry, as you can see, I had quite a lot of different interests. And uh, so after I got my bachelor's in biochemistry, I went on to do um, become a forensic officer. Um, I'd always been interested in forensic science and I think that's my mother's fault, um, but I'm so thankful for that. Uh, and then went on to get a PhD in chemistry postdoc and then assistant professor at Savannah State in 2006. They really hired me to develop a forensic science program for them. So I did that um, and I got my associate professor um, in 2012 and then full professor in 2016. I went on also to become their interim um, chair of chemistry and forensic science for like 2017 to 2021. So I basically, you know, I was a chair position. And then I left and came here for this wonderful opportunity at Roger Williams University as the director for their forensic science program. So now I'm completely focused on forensic science, but I still do chemistry. All right, so going back to just show you a little bit of my journey um, let's look at, you know, the way I started out. Um, so while at SSU, I started out pretty traditionally, still focused on research um, and doing chemistry research. Uh, so I got a grant from the National Institutes of Health, um, NIDA, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, in 2010. Um, and they gave me a pretty, pretty good sum of money um, to do research for like four years. And I um, synthesized some compounds that had good selectivity and um, binding affinity for um, specific receptors in the body called sigma receptors, sigma one and two. So I got those molecules patented and I have a nice collaborator that I met at Mercer University, which is very near to the um, Savannah State University campus. So that's what the molecules look like. Uh, just a little visual. We got a couple of publications out of it. They have um, affinities in the nano moles. Um, so our lead molecule is KSCM1, which is, uh, has an affinity for the sigma one at 27.5 nanomoles and at sigma two, um, 528 nanomoles. So it's like 19 fold. Um, the others were not as selective um, for sigma one, but they're still both selective for both sigma one and sigma two over all the other central nervous system receptors in the body. And we screen them for that. Now, when you get a grant through the NIH, you have this program called the PDSP, Psychoactive Drug Screening Program at Chapel Hill, and they'll screen your molecules for free as long as you punch in your little grant number, et cetera, and they're ver they verify it, then they'll screen your molecules for free. So they offered this service for free and you could always, um, well, you would ship your molecules off to them and then you can log in online and check the database. I also um, got involved with NASA. And so with a group of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, um, uh, at Jarvis Christian, Prairie View, Texas Southern, Tougaloo College. Uh, we collaborated on an interdisciplinary um, 
experiment or research project involving my compounds being tested for all these different biological activities. And this actually went into space. So it launched into space at the ISS, the International Space Station. And it involved students, undergraduate students. And they also funded us quite a bit of money um, to do this research. Uh, it was very exciting. I'll tell you that we were traveling back and forth from Savannah to um, Cape Canaveral. And uh, twice the mission got scrubbed. And, uh, you know, the students were into it so much that when the mission got scrubbed once, she was one, one of my students was so excited that she cried when, uh, you know, it, it didn't take off. But uh, the feeling was amazing once it did take off and go into space. And really the whole Savannah community and uh, the Savannah University campus was just behind us. They were watching it every step of the way. Uh, so that was a really um, exciting and notable experience for me. Um, but would I do it again? Probably not, because um, it's like they own you and uh, like you can't, you're not your own. And so um, it was a nice experience, but would I wanna do it again? No, but I would definitely, if you've never done it and uh, um, you have the opportunity to do something like this, um, certainly um, go for it. So our experiment actually took off in 2014. Now the main focus of me being in Savannah was <clears throat> to create the bachelor's um, in forensic science. And so I wrote up a proposal for this program and I wanted it to have two concentrations, um, forensic chemistry and forensic biology. Um, so when I got there in 2006, uh, you know, I had to get uh, situated, et cetera, write the proposal, learn about the institution. Uh, Savannah State is a part of the university system of Georgia, which is, you know, some of you already know that that's a group of universities run by uh, the university system. So um, a lot of things to learn coming from a postdoc position at Clemson. So eventually, though, um, everything uh, got passed and uh, it was approved and implemented in fall of 2011. And we started out with a small enrollment of six students and eventually it grew to the time that I left um, last year in fall. So we have approximately a hundred students in that program consistently. And so it's significantly larger than our chemistry program or chemistry program is usually small um, so it's, you know, it's grown significantly over the years and our students have been placed in um, multiple different areas and you'll get to see that in a little bit. Also, um, we were able to develop while I was there, a one of a kind 3D virtual reality crime scene facility for training the students. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that. The institution really supported the program a lot and they supported me um, developing that program a lot um, through Title III funding. And also we had other scholarships, um, scholarship programs through the NIH and the NSF. I'll show you those in a little bit. So when I got there, it was only me. And then by the time I left, we had two more faculty members. Now I wish it had been more Right, but uh, budget um, restrictions, et cetera, didn't allow for that. Um, money matters, as we all know, and when you're building a program to have our students be prepared uh, to enter the real world or to go and move on to graduate school, which is what we support, um, you have to have funds and you have to have funds for the students to do research, and scholarship um, for the students so that you can retain them as well, and also really good research equipment. And so we were fortunate to have good funding from the NIH and the NSF. Of course, I couldn't take those grants with me, they're institutional grants, but um, I really put a lot of my thoughts and ideas about curriculum development and uh, research and training students into those proposals and with the inclusion of uh, um, transforming some of our STEM classes into virtual reality 
enhanced classes. And that's what that NSF grant is all about. And so I'm a consultant for both of these grants now while I'm here in um, Rhode Island. So those grants don't end until 2025 and 2023. Um, this one was my baby, the NIH NIBIB grant. Um, and so they still have those programs going. Uh, we were able to get a lot of funding through Title III. And I estimate that over the years, 2014 to 2020, SSU actually sub, um, supported the program. Um, from my calculations, uh, to approximately $1.8 million. And so we um, have, they have wonderful facilities there right now. I'm very happy with what they have. Um, so we have like uh, 3D equipment for, um, to print cells, 3D cells in 3D to do various experiments. Uh, that's not my stuff, but I figured that um, the faculty there would be able to capitalize on that. Uh, we have the rapid hit um, DNA in which you can do a DNA profile in um, 90 minutes, a complete DNA profile in 90 minutes. So our forensic science students are trained on that. Um, so they'll be ready to go out and work in uh, with the GBI, et cetera. Um, we have a 3D scanner, the Faro 3D scanner, bottom left. And um, that basically can capture a 3D environment um, with point clouds, and then you can go in that 3D environment in virtual reality. So we've done it before where we've scanned the, the science building and I've actually gone into virtual reality and walked along the roof, the top of the science building. And um, it, it's weird, it's very weird, I'll tell you. Um, but it's so cool. Um, this is one of my labs back there. Well, it's not my lab anymore, but um, as you can see, they have awesome facilities. Um, the enrollment trend over the years um, since implementation, we started out with six students in 2011. So over the years, it has grown significantly. And uh, um, to the, up to the time that I left, it was um, competing with computer sciences um, for the second spot. So they go flip flop all the time. Um, so. Um, at the time that I took this data um, shot, we were a third place in the College of Sciences and Technology. Um, who are our students? Primarily African-American. Um, and then we have 10% Hispanic um, and 8% two or more races, 5% uh, uh, Caucasian. All right. so. The forensic science program is very interdisciplinary, and the whole deal is that we try to be different. Um, so, and in such a way, um, uh, we collaborate with the College of Liberal Arts for some of our curriculum. And so we're very big in doing different things, which you'll see a little bit of that. So for example, forensic art. I'm also an artist, but that's for another talk. Um, so I do paint in acrylic and the first slide actually has one of my paintings. Um, so I was interested in merging my art with science. And so each year, just before the academic year, I'm always thinking about what are we gonna do next? What is something that we could do um, that will be different that the students have never experienced before? And uh, we have a capstone experience uh, forensic science class called Crime Scene One and Two, and it occurs over the entire academic year. So we start in the first semester and complete it in the second semester. So I was like, why don't we do facial reconstruction? And the students were like, what? No, we can't do that. So we're not artists. And that's just too much. We starting with a skull, we don't know anthropology. Um, so the whole thing was that, you know, we were gonna get these skulls and we bought them from a place called Bone Clones. And uh, I would know the, et the ethnicity and uh, the sex, but they wouldn't. And then I brought in an expert, an anthropologist, Dr. Snow, 
And uh, then he would teach them all about identifying individuals using the skull. And then they would do a literature review where they would learn about the depth, the facial depth markers, which are those eraser heads you see on the skull. So they would do a literature review in the first semester. Dr. Snow would teach them all about the skull. And then in the second semester, I partnered with liberal arts, a sculptor, um, and he would come in and teach them how to work with the clay to rebuild that face. And so, you know, we were open to failure, but it didn't turn out that way. It turned out really, really amazing, as you can see right here. Um, the students worked in oil-based clay, and uh, when they saw that uh, face just emerging from the skull, it was so amazing because then they would use their phones and put over um, the face to take a picture, and the phone would recognize it as a face, and they're, they're like, oh, it's real, you know? Um, so it was to the point where um, the news media came in and actually did a story on them. And um, that was pretty exciting too. So this was the first time I really realized though, the difference between <laughs> uh, group work and teamwork. So these students really became a unified team during this project. And it wasn't just a group of students tossed together to do um, this work. So you had one student and she had a special role and they would call on her to, to just smoothen out the face. And then you had another student that he was good at something else. One student was good at making the air, et cetera. And uh, you know, they each knew their role and they allowed each person to just be good at what they did without uh, you know, um, stepping on somebody's shoes and trying to compete. They actually work together as a unit. And so to date, I've never um, seen that in any other project that uh, student project that I have participated in. Um, but this one, I can definitely say that the students did work as a team. And uh, I can say that they were in the flow. As you can see, I took a picture of them right here. They're totally immersed in this activity. Okay, so there was one student from that group, from that capstone experience, that she said she wanted to do her senior research project on facial reconstruction, and her name is Tyra. Um, so what I did is Bone Clones has this skull that they know what the person looks like. So I get to have that information and she would work on recreating the face because the ones before that we did, we didn't know what the people looked like. So we just assuming that, you know, um, they looked like uh, what the students produced. But this one now, we're actually gonna challenge the student to recreate a face that would be a likeness, not exactly, but a likeness to what this individual actually looked um, when they were alive. So, I teamed Tyra, she knew now how to do everything, the depth markers, et cetera. So I teamed her up with the, um, the sculptor, um, Professor Clark from Liberal Arts, and they worked on it together. Uh, none of them uh, saw the information that I had and I didn't participate in the project. And this is just the process. And her working, so she documented and the face is coming together. So over um, the semester, so this is him. I think she did a pretty good job. So Tyra actually um, went on to be recruited by the Savannah PD Police Department. I think it really looks like his younger self um, and she's a rookie. Um, so I think she did a really good job for her first time. And that's her, and she invited me to um, put her pin on for her pinning ceremony. She eventually wants to go on to the FBI. Okay, now we also um, look at blood spatter, and uh, we did a very manual experiment um, in 2014, 2015, and we had a great time but it was so labor intensive. There's still spatter stains on the ceiling right now, um, if you check from cast off. 
So um, we decided that, well, maybe we need a different method of doing this. The experiment turned out well, but you have to do trials in triplicates. So um, they had to clean a lot um, each time they did a trial for blood spatter. So we moved on and said, I met some individuals um, that worked with a company, BusyTech, and uh, um, they created virtual reality to train military. And uh, I had some funds through Title III that could have them create this software in virtual reality um, for us to process crime scenes or do blood spatter. Um, so that's exactly what we did. So in 2017, um, over the period of one year, I worked with Visitech to create a software, two, two software. One was um, a crime scene processing software and the other one was a uh, blood spatter. So the crime scene processing, you have multiple different scenes and they're randomized and the student goes in and processes the crime scene, collects evidence, et cetera, does drug tests um and uh, collects fingerprints they use alternate light source in there uh it's very immersive they learn even how to use a compass um and to lock in the position of the body and um their evidence and so it's randomized so it's never the same whenever you go in um there's even a camera in there it also assesses the students do they have on proper um, safety protective gear when they go in to process the crime scene so that's one software. And there's the other software, which is my personal favorite, which is the blood spatter simulator. And in this one, it's really research-based because you can change the scenario. You can change the scene, and then you can calculate the um, trajectory of the blood. Um, and then you can estimate the position of the body of the person when they were um, hit by, for example, a bullet, high velocity blood spatter. And when the lines converge, that will lock in the position of the perpetrator as well as the victim. So you'll be able to project back towards where the perpetrator was standing, et cetera, or where their location was when they fired a gun, for example, and where the victim was when they were hit by the gun, for example. So we've had our students um, go into virtual reality and set up their own experiments. Um, and they took one from a real life scenario and they recreated it. There was actually this individual, he committed suicide by using two guns simultaneously. Um, so the students were able to go in and recreate that scenario and compare the results that um, was in the journal to what they were able to calculate in virtual reality. So it's, it's very, very cool. Uh, here is a little movie that the students made. Um, that you guys can hear, but very to hear. You can hear and see. Okay, good. So for crime scene one and two, right, they, the students uh, are in groups and they process a crime scene. And so during the second semester, they present these results and they're cross-examined by faculty or myself or, and other students as well. So there, there was this one group that uh, every time they presented, one of their group members made a movie. And so <laughs> it was very cool because, um, uh, you know, it became very competitive, right? So, um, so I stole this movie from her. 
Okay, so now this is the blood spatter software. Uh, one student, as you can see from the bathroom scenario for that movie, she was gonna go in now and uh, prove her theory was correct by recreating it, reconstructing it in virtual reality. And so we use crash test dummies um, and there are different weapons. They have different caliber weapons in there. We're in the process of actually making this better, making it into a multiplayer um, software because right now it's a single player. And so she's gonna shoot the victim uh, in the forehead right above the eye uh, to compare the blood spatter. And so she's kind of estimating that he was in a kneeling position. So we couldn't let him kneel to crash test dummy. So she just kind of pushed him into the ground. And then she positioned him a little bit away from the wall, which was the urinal wall in the bathroom. She estimated that. And now she was going to compare the blood spatter. Um, the blood spatter, it uses a calculator. You can do automated calculation of the trajectory, or you can actually go up and pick blood spots and measure the length and the width of each blood spot. So you could compare your measurements to the automated um, measurement. So that's the calculator there. So she'd use, it, use the automated one. This is the first time she was in there. So she didn't know yet how to do her own manual calculations. But when they do this, as opposed to learning about it in a textbook and trying to recreate something um, in a lab, uh, they really learned a lot using the VR blood spatter. Uh, and so they were teaching each other and they understood the formula better. Um, so it, it's really not a game, but it's an enhancement to your curriculum. Um, and so I, you know, it, I continue to use virtual reality and I continue to work with Visitech to make what we have now better. Okay, so this was a two gun scenario. Um, the two gun suicide. So what he did was he shot himself in the temple and in the mouth. Uh, it was intraoral. And uh, um, the spatter patterns that the students developed um, were very comparable to what was in the journal article. And as you can see from the blue lines here, these are actual calculations that the students did. And they converged and they compared favorably with the automated um, calculations as well. So we're actually looking to publish this um, work that the students did. Uh, moving on from that, always we're moving, trying to develop new things on top of what we already have. So every year I'm always thinking, what can we do next? Um, and with the support of the institution, I was able to successfully do that progressively each year. And so what we did, we took it to the next step and we created a huge room with a halo screen. And so what could happen in there is that we can project whatever is going on in virtual reality on the walls within the halo screen room. So as you can see over here, these individuals, Dr. Carroll from Visitech and the GBI director, are in the halo screen room and they were just blown away by it. People just wanna get together and have a good time in the halo screen, <laughs> the halo screen room. So it's a great way to bring people together in an immersive environment without them having to put on VR goggles so they can see exactly what's going on. And back here, this is a chemistry software, Nanome, for all the chemistry guys that are here you really want to check out nano. So I use nano for docking small molecules on protein receptors. It's linked to the database, the um, protein database, PubChem, etc. And so it's really research-based, um, highly um, useful tool. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are using it now um, so that they can uh, um, build will ramp up the production, the production of their um, small molecules. And these are some of the VR pods, these rooms that um, 
we used to do the blood spatter in. Now it's all decked out with um, uh, VR accessories, etc. Oh, and this is a little video. And forensic science halo deck. In the Halo deck, we can project whatever is going on. And that's one of the crime the scenes reality, being projected. In the Halo room, the Halo you screen. can actually move around the crime scene around. So that everybody can see what's yeah, going so on for viewing. It's something that and you really have to experience for yourself. As, as we go along. So we're excited. The wonderful thing about VR is that class things class that are normally semester. dangerous for you to perform, like shooting somebody, you can do in VR to analyze the blood spatter. Okay, so I was talking about nano before. Um, a part of our faculty development for the chemistry and forensic science department at SSU when I was there was to enhance the curriculum um, with VR. So we got that NSF grant. And so um, we have moved forward um, at uh, enhancing uh, general chemistry, um, organic chemistry, biochemistry with nano. And so we're also collecting data about that. So we have um, a lot of data um, about the classes before they were transformed and the classes as they're being transformed. And so hopefully we can get some educational um, research publications out of that. So once again, the wonderful thing about Nanome is it's multiplayer, right? So you can take your whole class into Nanome. As you can see, I'm in Nanome right now with a bunch of colleagues. Um, so you can go in there and work on a molecule together. This is me and my student, Damani. Uh, I was tutoring him in VR. So I was at home and he was actually in the lab with a VR headset and um, we were working together in that space. So also you can be in a different country. So if you guys in Jamaica had um, Nanome and a VR headset, we could work together in that environment. And you feel as if you're actually there with each other. Um, and once again, uh, this is not a game. It's a very um, intensive research software. Um, a little, during my time there as well, we developed a, a certificate for virtual forensics to document crime scenes um, in virtual reality. So using that Faro scanner, you could document a crime scene and then also use that um, in the courtroom setting to show the jury, et cetera, what's going on at the crime scene. We had a forensic science week that we um, implemented each spring of the year, starting in 2016. That was one of the events that our students really looked forward to. We had a forensic science club that spearheaded that. We had a lot of community collaborations and partners, um, DHS, uh, GBI. Uh, we worked um, in the community to do demonstrations for various clubs, um, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, we had high school demonstrations very frequently. Um, we couldn't keep up with the demands to do um, demonstrations for students. And we recruited a lot of those students. These are the scholarship programs that they currently have. And we've also gotten a publication um, from one of them. But for example, one scholarship over here, NIH NIBA um, provides an honors um, scholarship program with $12,000 per year to be a part of that program with the intention that they will graduate and go on to pursue a career in biomedical sciences. Uh, the NSF grant is, uh, um, looks at transforming using the VR technology. So not we're using what we've learned through forensic science and now applying it to both biology and chemistry so that they can enhance the curriculum with virtual reality. Um, we're not saying convert things to virtual reality, reality but enhance it with a virtual reality tool. Uh, and it will help um, in the learning process for students as well as help with retention. Uh, where do uh, graduates of the forensic science program go? They go on to the FBI. Uh, they, some of them become teachers. 
Uh, they go on to graduate school for biochemistry, pharmacology, biomedical sciences. Uh, they do cybercrime, just, you know, the gamut. Um, it's so interdisciplinary that they have really a lot to choose from. Um, I have one of the students that is working, that worked with me there. Um, she's graduating um, from FIU um, this month with a PhD. Uh, her, uh, her research was focused on um, scent, um, identifying individuals using scent. Um, so I'm very excited for her. Actually, she was um, complaining that I left and came all the way up to Rhode Island and she wasn't very pleased with that. And then all of a sudden she calls me last week and says, oh, she got, uh, she went on a job interview somewhere an hour and a half from me. So <laughs> So she's looking, she, she wants to do, um, she wants to teach at a university, et cetera. So, um, so I'm very excited and I'm very proud of her. So in that program, we have about 50% of students that graduate out of the forensic science program, they go on to some area of forensic science or a relevant scientific um, science field. And also, uh, I don't only save it for Savannah State or Roger Williams, but I also offer my services to other institutions such as Edward Waters. So I served as an external consultant for them when they're developing their proposal. And it just got um, approved just um, this semester. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, forensic science is um, a new field because not a lot of institutions uh, um, offer undergraduate education in forensic science, but it's a really great way to teach science. I'm not necessarily promoting the students to go out and be become a forensic technician, but um, I want them to go on to graduate school for chemistry, biology, biomedical sciences, you know, whatever is their interest because um, forensic science teaches them science that's in a way that's relevant to them, uh, they're more likely to understand it, uh, more likely to be engaged in research um, because they see how it applies. And so I'm here to do it all over again at Roger Williams where I don't have any of those fancy things that I just left in um, Savannah, Georgia but I, I did get them to get me some um, VR headsets, uh, et cetera. So, but we're having a good time here and uh, um, I think I'll stay for a little bit. Uh, a lot of acknowledgements um, and I mentioned them, NASA, DOD, USG, all the students and co collaborators, uh, Department of Education, Title III, et cetera. And thank you for the invitation and for catching up on my journey. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay, I'm connected again. I feel connected. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Professor. And I hope you guys get, I hope you guys get um, some VR headsets because it, can you imagine us being in VR together? That is quite interesting, quite. I'm trying to. Okay. All right, so are there any questions for Professor Marriott? Thank you, Andrea. Hi, Professor Marriott, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't know if you remember um, two of my MARC students, Zuri and, um, and Deja. There are many students who are interested in working for the FBI. Do they have to do a forensic first degree or PhD to go and work for the FBI or they can do a PhD no. in any discipline? No, uh, as long as it's relevant to the FBI and whatever job that is posted by the FBI. And my student, he got his um, as a bachelor's. Mm -hmm. So as soon as he got his bachelor's in forensic science, but the most important thing is to keep a clean background because they do an extens extensive background um, search on individuals. Yeah, so if a student 
obtain a PhD in computational chemistry, they themselves can also apply their wish, depending on the type of position available, correct? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. Definitely. Um, thank you. Do you want to tell Welcome, Professor Ingram. I need to catch up with you. Good to have you in the this room. This is where all you guys hang out, I see. <laughs> it's all because of you, Colonel Sue, it's all because of you. Um, Patrick, go ahead. Yes. Um, Patrick Gordon, I am from Massachusetts. I'm here doing some research for six months, but I was wondering um, if you're familiar with the Massachusetts Crime State Lab. I believe it's in Wayland. And it might be a good resource. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm trying to um, get the tentacles out there. So, you know, um, I have met some people here, but, uh, and some of, uh, uh, students that have graduated from Roger Williams work with those labs too. Okay. Question. So what made you decide to go to Roger Williams? I mean, it looks like life was like popping at SSU. What made you decide to, um, to transition? Well, I felt that um, I had done all that I could there now. And so it was to the point where, you know, it, I cannot take it any further. So I, and I had started looking, but I was intentional. So I wasn't just looking to just leave like that, right? So I was looking, but I had to get the right spot. I didn't want a chemistry position. Um, I wanted forensic science, or um, if it was gonna be chemistry, they have to be open to forensic science, right? So that's what I wanted. So I, I was just looking and I wanted something that wasn't already built. I wanted something that I could build from the ground up. Yeah. Awesome, a new challenge. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Professor Lancashire. Hi, did you overlap with Craig Walters? With who? Craig Walters. No. Craig had done uh, a, a master's on virtual reality in terms of using a thing called Wonderland where you would, and we wrote some software that you could go into the, and we designed in 3D, uh, infrareds, UVs, GCs, and then we would bring in the spectra so that you could uh, actually walk up and down uh, along GC traces and, yeah. and all sorts of things. I know uh, you and, would have some information about that because I remember you were very into those things when I, um, <laughs> I was at UWI. Right, we, we ran for a few years uh, a thing for the magnetic susceptibility, the GUI, uh, so mm -hmm. that you could go in and uh, select a sample and then get it into the machine, turn on the balance uh, and read off the weights uh, and, and so on. Uh, the actual experiment could take anywhere up to three hours to do in the lab. And, and we could do the whole thing in about 10, 15 minutes uh, mm. on the computer. And the beauty of Wonderland was that you could have, we had up to about 12 kids in the lab who could join the, the same room. And if they came up close to each other, they could talk to each other. And as they moved away, they, it would drop off. Right? So, so you come is up. There still Wonderland. It it was run by Sun hmm. uh, Computer Systems, and then they got bought out, and the the unit got shut down. But a number of people who had been involved took it over and called it Open Wonderland. Hmm. Uh, and there were there was a, a a few other of these type of virtual worlds that uh, we looked at as well. So. We had a paper out, again, looking at spectra uh, within the, the virtual world and, virtual and so world. on. Mm. But uh, if you look, if you go into the Google SketchUp 3D database, you'll see a whole stack of uh, things that Craig had built in terms of molecules, because we could make the molecules in 3D that you could then move around and, and look mm -hmm. at. We did orbitals uh, and... and um, we looked as well at, uh, we had a bit of chemistry department. We went up and did a whole stack of pictures around the uh, campus uh, council room. 
with all the photos of the VCs and whatever around the walls uh, uh, and, and so on. So we had a lot of fun during this uh, one I know, year. I know you would have some feedback for me on this. <laughs> <laughs> Now, to get the smell, though, that, that sounds like an interesting one. Oh, to get the smell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions? So, so I didn't quite get the, the NASA project. So you had made some compounds and you're doing some testing. What exactly was the testing and the alignment with NASA? And why do you say you they, okay. they owned you? What I mean, I guess yeah, it was high know, security. No, it's like, you know, when it's time to go to um, the NASA center, you can't have anything else doing. You have to go, right? Um, and you can't call out, okay. right? So I didn't like that very much because I like my flexibility. Um, but what they were looking at is modulating the immune system of astronauts um, that were in space for the long term, right? So once they're up there for okay. an extensive period, when they come back down, okay. uh, it's a transition for them to get used to life back on Earth. So um, we were looking to modulate the immune system so that they wouldn't develop um, autoimmune disorders, et cetera, things like that from their time in space once they come back. And it was looking at anti-cancer properties as well. Okay. 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 Oh, I see okay. um, Alvin has put gotcha. Wanda there. Gotcha. In the gotcha. All right. John. I'll check that out. Thank you, Dr. We had, done, we had done a little exercise where I was doing something up at Mo Bay uh, campus at one stage, yeah. and Conrad was in the lab, and <laughs> we set up a discussion going mm -hmm. uh, where we went into the world uh, and could talk to each other as if we were standing beside each other. Mm. Uh, and it really did show the power of the, the idea of this communication. Mm -hmm. And you could have a blackboard there that you could go up and one could write on the blackboard. Yes. And then the other one could take over and, and rub mm. out something and change it. Uh, and, and, you know, so collaborative yeah. work was, was, was possible. Was that, is, was that in like a virtual reality or? Right. In a virtual Yeah, so, Did well, it's flat headset? screen. No, 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 nothing. Okay. It's flat screen, flat but screen. it's virtual. But okay. it's virtual, yeah. Looks In the easy. world, okay. Yeah. How long ago was that, Prof? Well, it probably about 2010, that, that sort of time frame. Got you. Okay. In the chat, Inca is asking, what are some of the approximate costs? for operating the Halo room and providing these immersive experiences, startup and ongoing costs. Okay, so the Halo room costs about 250,000. Um, there will obviously be maintenance costs. They have like five laser um, projectors in there, et cetera, and they're connected to the pods. Um, but with, uh, because, uh, we worked together with Visitech. They gave us a perpetually free license, so we didn't have to pay for like renewals because I wasn't, I didn't want software that we have to pay like ten thousand dollars every year, you know. But the Halo Room did need to be maintained. Okay. 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 Great. Um... Startup is usually expensive. But um, you don't need a halo room, really. Uh, but I would recommend um, headsets. Headsets are cool because uh, right now you can get an Oculus headset for $300 here. Um, but you can have it for your lifetime of being in college, right? When you consider textbook costs, et cetera, things like that, getting a headset is not an unreasonable thing. 
um, to say if you were a student and you wanted to. Obviously, um, institutions, if they wanted to, they could um, have headsets that they would um, loan out to students or have for specific classes. With during COVID time, um, because you know, sharing of headsets, we have um, a tech box. So where we zap the headsets with UV light and um, sanitize them as well as wipe them down. Definitely. Okay. Um, before I forget, Dr. Minor Case apologizes for not being online. She had some something else that she had to um, deal with. So, um, but she really would have wanted to have been here to Tell her see hello you again. For me. Tell her hello for me. I will certainly do so. I will certainly do so. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions. So I was asking, oh, in terms of visiting, so so all, all and sundry can come and visit the, the Halo Lab, the Halo. That's in Savannah now. That's I in know. Savannah now. Uh, yeah, we actually, okay. um, a part of uh, the funding is to have events for the community. And so we actually had um, community coming in during uh, heart awareness and breast cancer, and they would have an, a VR experience showing them about uh, breast cancer. So they learn about breast cancer, they learn about the heart and uh, they really, really enjoyed it. It was well attended. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, I wrote it up the proposal that they would have certain number of events throughout the academic year to engage the community and to educate the community as well. And at the same time, the community would come in and see the facilities and what the institution has to offer. Definitely, definitely. And, and, and that would be, a, that's an outreach opportunity, really, um, yeah. for persons to come in and, and yeah, see and be excited. Yeah, and I totally enjoy that. A part of, you know, why I continue to do this is because I like interacting with the community and, uh, um, and, and I like technology. I like all this. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You're Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> Hey, Geneve. Yes. yes, Geneve visited before it was completed. So she saw the shell, but uh, um, uh, it wasn't uh, up and running. It wasn't alive. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. All righty. Um, I don't see any other questions from anyone else in the chat. Um. Do have you one question in terms of any type of collaboration? Is there any potential for any collaboration with our government of Jamaica? You were at, you were at the forensic science lab um, many, many moons ago. And I actually recall um, one of your former groupies, Mark, who also was at the lab. He spent a total of three days working there and then resigned, <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> But um, yeah, is there any um, collaboration or any potential for collaboration? Because you do know we do have our crime challenges here in Jamaica. Um, yeah, is any of the work that you're doing in any way able to, to impact us here in Jamaica um, to, to help us with our, our crime issues? Well, I'm not necessarily, uh, it would have to be in a discussion with uh, their needs or somebody in mm -hmm. the lab there. So. I don't necessarily see directly, except um, with some of the VR tools, possibly with training, training of individuals. Um, that's a possibility because we could um, train, for example, um, officers or et cetera um, here and in our outreach and we'll certainly um, show them the blood spatter and um, processing of crime scene. I think it's a great training tool. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the blood spatter, if we work on, a, on it a little bit more, could be an excellent research tool. Um, but it just depends on how people want to use it. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Dr. Gallimore Winkler, was there a forensic um, science or forensic chemistry I recall reading at in the chemistry department at UA. 
Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to take that one. I don't know I was okay. having anything specific uh, for forensics. Maybe I read somewhere else. <laughs> um, we we do have within the I'm not even sure if it's our faculty, it could be could be aligned to MedSci. Um, mm. we do have a master's, master's related programs. In but forensic no, science. Right. Nothing undergraduate. I did have master's, master's in forensic science there at UE. Right. Yes. So okay. Indeed. Okay. How how would that program be wholesomely different from um what Dr. Marriott is describing? Uh, well, you don't you don't know. Or is this at the undergraduate level here? Mm -hmm. However, their forensic science program, your master's program, is it uh, forensic genetics? Is it forensic okay. chemistry or is it DNA focused? You know, what is it? Okay, I, I really am not the, not a pro with this. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in here. It um, might be but I know we've done some forensic, I think there's, there's some forensic chemistry and um, I don't know for sure, to be honest. Anybody else, any of my colleagues can help me with this one? Good morning, we and everyone else. Thank you, Carlos, for a lovely talk. Hi, <laughs> Dr. Mirage. So yeah. yeah, man. Um, the, the first science program here is actually a master's program, um, an MSc program. So it has four, it has four sub-disciplines. There is chemistry, there is toxicology, and there's some others. But it, um, we, we run the chemistry part of it out of this department, yeah. And we also help it with the labs as well yeah so yes it's an integrated approach uh, it's not out of medical sciences though actually out of biochemistry department no no the biochemistry section in basic medical sciences okay okay okay, okay. okay. Yes. Um, good afternoon everyone i just like to point out that i posted a link to the actual degree in the chat so if you okay. want to see it okay Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. There's one last question. If um, Roger Williams University offers a master degree in forensic science, chemistry, no. or psychology, are you, no. you're working on it? Well, they have a master's in forensic psychology, but not in forensic science. Okay, okay, awesome. So that is something that, is it an undergrad down institution? Line, down the line, down the line. Down the line. <laughs> down the line. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, um, it just leads me to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing with us, Carla Sue. And I trust that um, we have the recording and there are always students, there are always undergraduate students who are excited about forensic science. And so, you know, who knows in the future what type of alignments we could have, you know, maybe we could have um, students. Um, I, I surmise you still have some type of a alignment to SSU um, yes. because, yeah, I'm sure there must have been sad to see you go that must because you, you, you really built something from the ground up. And so they, it would have been bittersweet i'm sure in some respects but any connections that you still have there or where you're at right now um building that program out then i'm sure that there are people who would have definite interests so. yes this is a definitely good um and thank you for the invitation and it was good to touch base with dr lancashire again i knew when i was talking about vr you know that he would have <laughs> a lot of feedback <laughs> The, awesome. the, the fascination, of course, of things like CSI mm -hmm. is that you can go into this lab and every machine works <laughs> and all the results are available within five minutes, you know, no yeah. calibrations and no waiting for two days for things mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, acclimatize and stabilize. That's the beauty of, of, of the virtual something mm -hmm. or other. All the results are always ready in five minutes before the show <laughs> finishes. <laughs> Well, you know, technology has its challenges too. You know, it works fine when you're alone, and then when you invite people to see it, it won't work. Yes, we yeah. know that. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you all for hopping on today. 
I it was really very interesting, and we trust that you would all. I know be... Conrad is going to get a VR headset. We'll be in Nano before you know it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. All right, guys, have yourself right. a wonderful rest of the afternoon. And I just want to congratulate Shante. She did her um, trans upgrade seminar yesterday. I believe I was not able to, to be online, but I heard that it went well. Congrats, Shante. And um, we look forward to, to having more persons continue through the, continue through the ranks to, um, to get to where they want to go. All right. Thank you Thank very you much, everybody. guys. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Yeah, man. Bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>